since the reign of King Viserys, there had not been a ball of any sorts in King's Landing. There was no place for them during the Dance of the Dragons. The ball would be one like no other, with a prize on offer larger than any that had come before. At Tawny's, fair maidens and high ladies vied for the honour of being crowned the Queen of Love and Beauty, but such reigns only lasted for a night. Whichever maid King Aegon chose would reign over Westeros for a lifetime, with her son one day being king himself. The highborn descended on King's Landing, from keeps and castles in every part of the Seven Kingdoms. In an effort to limit the numbers, Lord Peak decreed the contest would be limited to maidens of noble blood under the age of 30, yet even so, more than a thousand girls crowded into the Red Keep on the appointed day, a tide far too great for even the hand to stem. Even from across the narrow sea, they came. The Prince of Pentos sent a daughter, the Archon of Tyrosh a sister, and the daughter of ancient houses set sail from Myr, and even of Volantis. Though sadly none of the Volantine girls ever arrived in King's Landing, being carried off by corsairs from the Basilisk Isles on the way. Each maiden seemed lovelier than the last, Mushroom says in his testimony. Sparkling and spinning in their silks and jewellery, they made a dazzling sight as they made their way to the throne room. No doubt these maidens dreamed sweet dreams of dancing with the king, charming him with their wit, exchanging coy glances with him over a cup of wine. But there was to be no dancing, no wine, nor opportunity for conversation, be it witty or dull. The gathering was not truly a ball in the ordinary sense. King Aegon sat atop the Iron Throne, clad in black with a golden circlet around his head and a gold chain at his throat, as the maidens paraded beneath him one by one. As the King's Herald announced the name and lineage of each candidate, the girls would courtesy, the King would nod down at them, and then it would be time for the next girl to be presented. By the time the tenth girl was presented, the King had doubtless forgotten the first five, Mushroom says. The fathers could well have sneaked them back in the queue for another go around, and some of the more cunning likely did. A handful of the braver maidens made so bold as to address the king in an attempt to make themselves more memorable. Ellen Baratheon asked his grace if he liked her gown. Alyssa Rice told them that she had come all the way from Runestone to be with him today. Patricia Redwine went to her one better by declaring that her party had travelled from the arbour and had thrice been forced to beat back attacks by outlaws. I shot one with an arrow, she declared proudly. Others ventured compliments about his city, his castle, his clothes. A northern maid named Barbara Bolton daughter of the Dreadfort, said, If you send me home, your grace, please send me with food, for the snows are deep and your people are starving. The boldest tongue belonged to a Dornish woman, Moriah Orgyle of Sandstone, who rose up from her courtesy smiling and said, Your grace, why not climb down from there and kiss me? Aegon did not answer her. He answered none of them. He gave each maiden a nod to acknowledge that he had heard them. Then Sir Marston and the King's Guard saw them on their way. Music wafted over the hall all throughout the night, but could scarcely be heard over the scuffle of footsteps, the din of conversation, and from time to time the faint soft rounds of weeping. The throne room of the Red Keep is so cavernous a chamber, larger than any hall in Westeros, save the blasted ruin of Harrenhal, but with more than a thousand maids on hand, each with her own retinue and parents, siblings, guards and servants, it soon became too crowded to move, and suffocatingly hot. Though outside a winter wind was blowing, the herald charge of announcing the names and lineages of each of the fair maidens lost his voice and had to be replaced. Four of the hopefuls fainted, along with a dozen mothers, several fathers and a septon. One stout lord collapsed and died. The Maiden's Day Cattle Show, Mushroom named the ball afterwards. Even the singers who made so much of it beforehand found little to sing about as the events unfolded and the king himself appeared even more restless as the hours passed and the parade of maids continued. It was just as the hand desired. Each time his grace frowned, shifted in his seat, or gave another weary nod, the likelihood of his choosing Lady Turnips increased, Lord Unwin reasoned. Marielle Peak arrived in King's Landing almost a moon's turn before the ball, and her father had made certain that she spent part of every day in the king's company, brown of hair and eyes, with a broad, freckled face, and crooked teeth that made her shy with her smiles. Lady Turnips was four and ten, one year older than Aegon, she was no great beauty, Mushroom says, but she was fresh and pretty and pleasant, and his grace did not seem averse to her. During the fortnight leading up to Maiden's Day, the dwarf tells us Lord Unwin arranged for Myriella to share half a dozen suppers with the king, called upon to entertain them during those long, awkward meals. Mushroom tells us that King Aegon said as little as they ate, but seemed more comfortable with Lady Myriella than he had been with Queen Jahera, 
which is to say, not comfortable at all. He did not seem to find her presence distasteful. Three days before the ball, he gave her one of the little queen's dolls. Here, he said as he thrust it at her, you can have this. Not quite the words the innocent young maidens dream of hearing, perhaps, but Marielle took the gift as a token of affection, and her father was most pleased. Lady Marielle brought the doll with her when she made her own appearance at the ball, cradling it in her arms as if it was a babe. She was not the first to be presented. That honour went to the daughter of the Prince of Pentos. Her father had seen to it that she came before the king late in the first hour, far enough back so he could not be accused of giving her pride a place, but far enough forward so the king was still reasonably fresh. When his grace greeted Lady Marielle by name and said not only it was good of you to come, my lady, but also I am pleased you like your doll, her father surely took heart, believing all his careful scheming had borne fruit, yet it would be undone in a moment by the king's half-sisters, the very twins whom succession and wing peak had been so determined to prevent. Fewer than a dozen maids remained, and the press had thinned considerably, when a sudden trumpet blast heralded the arrival of Bela Valarian and Raina Corbray. The doors to the throne room were thrown open, and the daughters of Prince Damon and Lena Valarian entered upon a blast of winter air. Lady Bela was great with child. Lady Raina, wan and thin from her miscarriage, yet seldom had they seemed more as one. Both were dressed in gowns of soft black velvet, with rubies at their throats, and a three-headed dragon of House Targaryen on their cloaks. Mounted on a pair of coal-black chargers, the twins rode the length of the hall side by side. When the Marsden waters of the Kingsguard blocked their path and demanded they dismount, Lady Bela slashed him across the cheek with her riding cop. His grace, my brother, can command me. You cannot. At the foot of the Iron Throne, they reined up. Lord Unwin rushed forward demanding to know the meaning of this. The twins paid him no more heed than they would a serving man. Brother, Lady Raina said to Aegon, if it please ye, we have brought your new queen. Her lord husband, Sir Corwin Corbray, brought the girl forward. A gasp went through the hall. Lady Daenerys of House Valarian boomed out the herald. Somewhat hoarsely, daughter of the late and lamented Daron of that house and his lady wife, Hazel of House Hart, also departed, a ward of Lady Bela of House Targaryen and Alan the Oakenfist of House Valarian, Lord Admiral, Master of Driftmark and Lord of the Tides. Daenerys Valarian was an orphan. Her mother had been carried off by the winter fever. Her father had died in the Stepstones when his ship went down. His own father had been that Sir Vaiman Valarian, beheaded by Queen Rhaenyra, but Daron had been reconciled with Lord Alan and had died fighting for him. As she stood before the king that maiden's day, clad in pale white silks of mirish lace, her long hair shining in torchlight, and her cheeks flushed with excitement, Tenera was but six years old, yet so beautiful she took the breath away. The blood of old Valeria was strong in her, as is often seen in the sons and daughters of House Valarian. Her hair was silver, laced with gold, her eyes as blue as the summer sea, her skin as smooth and pale as winter snow. She sparkled, Mushroom says, and when she smiled, the singers rejoiced, for they knew that here at last was a maid worthy of a song. Daenerys' smile transformed her face, men agreed. It was sweet and bold and mischievous, all at once. Those who saw it could not fail to think, here is a bright, sweet, happy little girl, the perfect antidote for this young king's gloom. When Aegon III returned her smile and said, Thank you for coming, my lady. You look very pretty. Even Lord Unwin Peak surely must have known that the game was lost. The last few maidens were brought forward hurriedly to do their turns, but the king's desire to put an end to the parade was so palpable that poor Henrietta Woodhull was sobbing as she courtesied. As she was led away, King Aegon summoned his young cupbearer, Gaiman Powhair. To him was given the honour of making the announcement. His grace will marry Lady Daenerys of House Valarian, Gaiman shouted happily, caught in a trap of his own making. Lord Unwin Peak had no choice but to accept the king's decision with as much grace as he could muster. In a council meeting the next day, however, he gave vent to his wrath. By choosing for his bride a girl of six, this sulky boy thwarted the entire purpose of the marriage. It would be years before the girl was old enough to bed, and even longer till she could produce a true-born heir. Until such time, the succession would remain clouded. The foremost duty of the regency was to guard the king against the follies of youth, he declared follies such as this. For the good of the realm, the king's choice must be set aside so that his grace marry a suitable maid of childbearing age. Such as your daughter? asked Lord Rowan. I think not, nor were his fellow regents more sympathetic. For once the council remained adamant, defying the hand's wishes. The marriage would proceed. The betrothal was announced the next day, as scores of disappointed maidens streamed out of the city gates for home. 
King Aegon III Targaryen wed Lady Daenerys of House Valerian on the last day of 133 AC. The crowd that lined the streets to cheer the royal couple was significantly smaller than those who had come for Aegon and Jehera, for the winter fever had carried almost a fifth of the population of King's Landing away, but those who did brave the day's bitter winds and snow flurries were delighted with their new queen. Charmed by her happy waves, flushed cheeks, and shy sweet smiles, Ladies Baylor and Raina, riding just behind the royal litter, were greeted with exuberant cheers as well. Only a few took note of the king's hand further back, with his face as grim as death. <laughs>